This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, mostly what I work on is grape rootstock. So we're going to talk a little bit about grape rootstocks because I'm contractually obligated to speak about that. And then we're going to leave the bounds of real science and uh, chase speculation and innuendo and other things which I find amusing and hopefully you will find amusing or at least uh, confusing. It's something to the lights. Um, the most important people in our research program on grape rootstocks are the people who actually conduct the work and who take care of the plants in the greenhouse and our nematode colony every single day of the year, even on federal holidays and on weekends and when the power goes out. And that's uh, Deb Johnston and Jason Plate. So many thanks to them for conducting most of the experiments, which I have the honor to be here today with you to talk about. And uh, they have actually been the ones who extracted the seeds, grew them, and in most of the cases collected the data which I am going to present. So many thanks to Deb and Jason. And if there are some cases where we have older data, I usually explain who it was that helped us to generate that data as well. Of course, thanks to the Department of Horticulture and to Neil for the invitation and to the different uh, organizations and institutions who have supported the research which uh, we are going to describe, often in the context of grape rootstock improvement and then these other projects which turned out to be interesting and somehow, we hope, uh, tangentially related to rootstock development and breeding in the long run. Uh, most of our funding comes from the USDA Agricultural Research Service, which is my employer, and USDA ARS has a research uh, team in two research units at the experiment station in Geneva. All right. This is a grape root, many times magnified, and it is swollen in many spots and has small red dots on it. Those red dots, which to the naked eye are about the size of a typewritten period, are egg masses of root knot nematodes, Meloidogyne species. These happen to be Meloidogyne arenaria. The other common species of Meloidogyne nematodes make similar symptoms and have a similar egg mass found on the surface of the root. These have been stained with ESNY so that you can see them easily with the naked eye, or maybe not so easily, since we spend a lot of time looking at pounds and pounds and pounds of roots to find those egg masses. We are interested in finding resistance against root knot nematodes. Why? Are root knot nematodes a problem in New York? Well, they're a problem in New York for certain crops. They're not really a problem for grape, although you would certainly find root knot nematodes in vineyards. In the United States, most of the vineyards are in the San Joaquin Valley between Sacramento and Bakersfield, and by far, root knot nematode is the most important problem in those vineyards. So by area in the United States, we have more area of vineyard where root knot nematode is the chief problem than any other soil pest, even phylloxera. So phylloxera is an insect which feeds on grapevine roots and can also feed on leaves, and that's a serious pest that can actually kill grapevines, but by area, we have much more territory where root knot nematode is the key pest. It's not Napa or Sonoma or the east side of Cuba Lake, which make wonderful fine wines. It tends to be more like popular consumer areas where grapes uh, are grown and wine is made. So if you enjoy wines which retail for under $5 a bottle, probably you would be more concerned about root knot nematode than for the $60 to $70 bottles of wine. They're all part of viticulture and enology, but the root knot nematode prone areas have usually received less attention, certainly in the popular press and by the wine consumers, but for viticultural purposes, they represent the ungrafted and real potential for resolving a soil pest problem through the introduction of rootstocks. There are nematode-resistant rootstocks which are used, and as you might expect from generations of using nematode-resistant rootstocks, we have in fact found a rootstock-resistant nematode. Gene-for-gene uh, -gene selection, just like antibiotic-resistant bacteria, USDA released two rootstock varieties about 40 years ago, Freedom and Harmony, and after a few generations of using those rootstocks in one site, you usually select for a virulent population of nematode, just as you might expect, because there's nothing else for the nematodes to feed on, so the one or two individuals which are capable of breaking that resistance then reproduce. The root knot nematodes which are important on grape rootstocks are all obligate mitotic parthenogenates, which means that not only do they not need to have sex in order to reproduce, they can't have sex. And so if you have one individual which is virulent on a rootstock, it can just lay lots and lots of eggs, about 2,000 per female, 
and uh, that allows you to have a big blow up in the population of nematodes. We don't think that they actually spread from location to location. Uh, virulent populations probably aren't spreading around the San Joaquin Valley. They're probably arising de novo wherever you are from the existing root knot nematode population. So that project, developing, identifying nematode resistance against the virulent nematode populations has been our main focus for the last 12 years. I started in the fall of 99. Identifying sources of superior resistance, deploying them into improved rootstock varieties, and evaluating those varieties in a place where the nematodes are important, and finally releasing them to the nurseries and the viticultural <coughs> community. Here are some of our advanced selections and new rootstock varieties. Matador and Kingfisher are two nematode-resistant rootstocks which were selected in Geneva and were released in 2010 as new varieties. We also have Minotaur, which is a full sibling of Matador. These rootstocks were all selected because they provide protection against those virulent nematode populations, which are capable of feeding on and damaging freedom and harmony. So if you like, they are the next generation of rootstocks. Do we think that they are more durable than the previous generation of rootstocks, or are we just entering into an arms race with the nematode? Well, probably we're entering into an arms race with the nematode. If I play my cards right, I can just arms race the nematodes until the end of my career, and I'll retire <laughs> and leave that to the next folks, uh, and they can solve the problem once and for all. Um, or possibly we can find ways to pyramid nematode resistance or find other durable sorts of nematode resistance uh, that are less amenable to that selection for virulent populations. So this is a story we've heard in other sorts of plant breeding. We have a variable pathogen which responds to the deployment of resistance and then the plant breeders can respond to the response and uh, this can go on. Um, when we are selecting for new varieties of rootstock, we're chiefly concerned with resistance against pests and diseases which attack and damage the grapevine roots. That's the chief reason that we use rootstocks in viticulture. We can easily propagate nearly any variety from cuttings. The rootstock provides us with protection against the pests and the pathogens which are living in the soil. There also is an aspect of uh, effect of the rootstock on the growth and development of the scion. So we want to be aware of how the scion and the rootstock interact. In selecting Matador and Minotaur and Kingfisher, we selected the rootstocks in the trial, which gave us an improved yield efficiency over freedom. In other words, those vines make, for the same amount of shoot growth, or branches or wood, they make more fruit. So there's an increased efficiency, which we believe is related to the rootstock. We've seen that with other rootstocks, been reported by other groups as well. So we've selected the rootstocks which are resistant to nematodes and which give us an improved yield efficiency. Uh, what the nurseries have expressed great pleasure about is the fact that the vines are a little bit smaller. That means that they get to sell more vines per acre, and since they sell vines on a per piece basis, not on a per acre basis, then everyone's happy. The grower gets more yield efficiency per plant, the nursery sells more plants, and we have resistance against the nematodes as well. Uh, this material on the right is, on my right, is uh, an example of one of our selections still in trial, and you may be looking at this if you're working with rootstocks and say, Nesbidiana, what's that? Well, that's a wild grape species that's native to eastern Mexico, and we have been using the North American, including Mexican, wild species as sources of nematode resistance in developing new rootstocks. Rootstocks need to be easily propagated from dormant cuttings. That characteristic mostly comes from the species Vitis riparia and Vitis rupestris, and so those species are found in nearly all of our rootstock hybrids. It turns out that there's a lot of nematode resistance in wild grape species and accessions, so having the repository here in Geneva and also at Davis is a great source of new nematode resistance genes and alleles. Just why there's so much nematode resistance in wild grapes is anybody's guess. There aren't a lot of nematodes in the forests where wild grapevines live, so maybe it's accidental or it's resistance against something else. It doesn't really matter, uh, but it's an interesting question from an ecological perspective. So as we're selecting, it needs to be something which will propagate the nurseries, and we have had many selections unfortunately tossed out because the nurseries call me up and they say, the stuff doesn't propagate, you're not getting your plants, I don't care how resistant it is. If it can't be propagated from a dormant cutting, it's not a grapevine rootstock. In looking at nematode resistance and finding materials from the wild, we would like to characterize how that resistance is inherited 
and how different sources of nematode resistance relate to one another. Uh, generally speaking, grapevine is more or less a diploid. We'll talk more about that. And so if you have any given uh, locus for nematode resistance, usually you have up to two choices of alleles which you can put at that uh, particular site. However, if you have multiple loci for nematode resistance, that increases our chances of being able to pyramid multiple sources into one variety or selection, and therefore we might be able to have a more durable plant if we have multiple loci that are conditioning nematode resistance. So what we know for sure is that Vitus mustangensis in the upper left and Vitus cordifolia in the upper right represent loci which are different for their nematode resistance compared to the locus which is found in freedom and harmony. So we know that those loci independently segregate. In fact, the alleles that we've deployed from Vitus mustangensis and Vitus cordifolia provide superior protection to that found in harmony and in freedom. So we know that not only is it a different locus, that also provides protection against a broader population of nematodes. So now we have rootstocks which are pyramiding, which have both and different sources of nematode resistance into individual plants. And we've confirmed that the old fashioned bad way by test crossing, uh, because we don't yet have effective molecular markers which can diagnose that. So uh, we're now engaged in working with Bruce Reich and others on the VitusGen project to help identify the molecular markers which are predictive of nematode resistance, which will facilitate not only breeding, but also pyramiding multiple sources of resistance. We have multiple sources of the single dominant gene resistance, like we see from Freedom, from Harmony, from Vitus mustangensis, from Vitus cordifolia. There's another source from Vitus nesbidiana, and also from an Estevalis uh, rufotomentosa type. And those all behave very nicely as single dominant uh, alleles coming from uh, one locus. We also have sorts of nematode resistance which do not behave cleanly as a single dominant allele, but still provide a great degree of nematode resistance against those virulent populations, including Vitus biformis in the lower left, which is a tropical and subtropical species. Our accessions come from the lowlands of East Central Mexico, and we'll talk more about the Vitus biformis uh, later on in the talk. Uh, because they're a tropical species, they have a lot of tropical species characteristics, like they don't ever want to go to sleep and uh, try to keep their leaves all the time, which might be an advantage or disadvantage comparing uh, where you live. And Vitus rotundifolia, the muscadine grape, native to the southeastern United States and long recognized as being highly resistant against many grapevine, meaning bunch grape, pests and pathogens, uh, also highly resistant to root knot nematode. What we have found is that crosses with Vitus rotundifolia uh, tend to be less cold hardy than either of their parents. This again has been reported by other research groups, but when you find something which is winter killing at 35 degrees Fahrenheit, not only can you not grow it in the Finger Lakes, you actually can't grow it in Fresno or even Bakersfield. So those materials were tossed out of the program, despite the fact that they were highly resistant to root knot nematodes. We are interested not only in root knot nematode resistance, but also in uh, protection against other sorts of pests and pathogens. Phylloxera is one which I mentioned. That's an insect related to an aphid, which can feed on and damage the grapevine roots. A group at the Gavallerhof Viticulture and Grape Breeding Program, and also at Geisenheim in Germany, has been working on characterizing the hypersensitive resistance against phylloxera, which comes from the rootstock burner. Burner is a hybrid which has via scenario as one of its parents, and it has a hypersensitive resistance. So as the phylloxera tries to feed, either on the roots or on the leaves, there's just a necrotic response and the phylloxera fails to establish a feeding site. Is that better than the resistance and tolerance that we have in the rootstocks which we're currently using, like 3309 or St. George, which have a mixture of resistance and tolerance? Um, it's not clear that it's either better or worse. Uh, we certainly don't have enough long-term field trials. We know that in nature in North America, some species have hypersensitive resistance and some species have this resistance and tolerance combination, and they seem to coexist in nature. Uh, it's hard for me to believe that if you had exclusively rootstocks in an area where there were no wild grapes to provide a refuge that the phylloxera would put up with a hypersensitive resistance gene for very long because there'd be a huge incentive for the phylloxera to overcome it, just as we saw in the root knot nematodes. But we are continuing to work with burner as a source of phylloxera resistance, that's the vine on the left, and trying to, to introduce that hypersensitive phylloxera resistance into our uh, other grapevine rootstock backgrounds in combination with other sources of resistance and tolerance. <clears throat> 
what else are we doing with, with grape vines? If you're interested in studying root knot nematode resistance, somewhere along the line, you're going to need some grape roots. If you plant an individual grape seed, in about a month, it'll be four or five inches tall, and have enough roots that you can put some infectious juvenile nematodes on it, and then six or eight weeks later, you can wash the roots off and look for the symptoms and signs of the nematode infection, stain the roots and look for those galls and the egg masses and determine that a plant, a given plant is resistant or tolerant or somewhere along the, spe the, the uh, spectrum between resistant and susceptible. Suppose you wanted to have a replicated measure of resistance. In other words, maybe I spaced out, I forgot to inoculate one seedling and it looks resistant just because it got, we forgot to inoculate it. Well, the answer is we have to replicate. But what a hassle it is to take an individual seedling, plant it out into the vineyard, wait for a couple of years, three years, four years, until you have enough cuttings that you can then take cuttings from that plant in the vineyard, root them, and they root at different rates, so we have plants of different sizes and root systems. Wouldn't it be easier if we could do this much more quickly on something small? So now we are screening individual rooted leaves. A grapevine ordinarily does not make adventitious buds. So you can take a mature, fully expanded leaf, root it in a little bark sponge, just as we've done here, and plant that in a pot. And it will live more or less happily for months. It doesn't grow a bit except in the roots. So we take this individual rooted leaf, put it in a little pot. Now we can easily make replications from a seedling-grown plant in the span of a few months because the individual seedling has many leaves. We can then make replications, the little plants, the root leaves, don't need to be pruned because they just don't grow. Uh, eventually, we wash the soil off the roots and we have the same type of nematode response as we would expect to see from the individual seedling or from a rooted cutting. Uh, it never grows any more shoots. It just stays as an adorable little leaf. It's a little peculiar when you see them in the greenhouse, but we've allowed ourselves a way to get a replicated observation on a seedling which has never gone out to the vineyard. And that's useful for genetic mapping purposes for doing molecular marker development or any other project in which we'd like to accelerate replicated nematode testing. In most cases for breeding, it's enough that we can make a first pass through the seedlings because we're going to go back later and evaluate them for rooting ability, grafting ability, double check the nematode resistance. In a case of a mapping population, we'd like to just look at the nematode resistance and do that as quickly as possible. So that's where the rude leaves come in. Other things that we've been working on uh, when we were out with grape rootstocks. Uh, anybody want to hazard a guess what the difference is between these two leaves? Not everyone at once, though. Okay, here's a qualifier. How about the one on the left looks toothier? Do you believe that? Maybe. Question, qu maybe questionable. <laughs> Do they look different? How about that? Not very different. Well, they're different enough. The leaf on the left is thicker. It has spikier teeth, as far as I'm concerned. The petiole or sinus, where the petiole connects to the blade, is a slightly different shape. And if you conduct flow cytometry on the plants on which these leaves were growing, you will find out that the plant on the left is an autotetraploid of the plant on the right. And we have generated autotetraploids by treating the mature plants growing in the greenhouse with surflan herbicide, active ingredient arizolin, over a span of 30 to 35 days. And arizolin acts as a plant microtubulin poison. We know that it is an herbicide. And in fact, we are usually losing between a third and a half of the plants after we spray them over the course of a month with an herbicide. Uh, but a few survive. And we can select those plants which have the apparent tetraploid phenotype. They're very slow growing and they have a thicker leaf with spikier uh, marginal teeth and grow that as its own plant. Why would you do such a thing? Autotetraploid grape rootstocks are devigorating compared to the diploid progenitor. So if you like a particular grape rootstock but it's just too vigorous for your particular application, well, hang on, we're going to make you an autotetraploid of that. The pioneering work in this area was done in Japan and um, their rootstock studies demonstrate you can use the autotetraploid in the same conditions for the same pest and uh, soil conditions as you would use the diploid progenitor, but that is devigorating. So we are using this approach for rootstocks which have particular pest and disease resistance 
but which have a problem with excess vigor. In this case, it's 03916, and trying to develop a lower vigor selection or clone of those already known rootstocks. The best evidence suggests that if we were then to make crosses amongst the auto tetraploids, we would get allo tetraploids, and those have much, much higher vigor. So perhaps down the line, we'll have higher vigor rootstocks out of this project as well. For the uh, openers, we're trying to find lower vigor versions since often that is what growers are complaining about is not enough low vigor rootstocks across a spectrum of different pest and disease resistances. It's a little bit of a dark art. So people have uh, generated tetraploids and grape rootstocks using all sorts of techniques. And uh, the one thing which unifies them is that they never adequately describe what they're doing, uh, either how much or what or for how long they did. And we're not going to do it either. So that's as much information <laughs> as you're going to get. Have them. Uh, a few more things about spiky leaves and uh, slipping beyond the, the realm of rootstocks just a touch. The leaf on the right is a little spikier on the teeth uh, than on the one on the left. You say, my, this guy spends too much time in the vineyard looking at leaves if he's concerned about what's spiky or not. This is a variety called Chambersen, which is a grape that's used to make red table wines. It's grown a little bit in the Finger Lakes. It usually likes a longer ripening season. So you see it more in Pennsylvania and in the Midwest. This particular picture was taken in Illinois. It's a wine grape, and like nearly all of our wine grapes, Chamberson ought to be perfect flowered. However, growers in the Midwest have complained that they find fruitless vines in their Chamberson plantings, and the vines are fruitless because they are staminate or male flowered. Uh, where do those come from? Well, we don't know exactly where they come from. We believe that they really are a bud sport of Chamberson. They have the same microsatellite fingerprint as Chamberson, and yet they have male flowers. So we've collected several of these from vineyards in the Midwest where the growers said, yeah, take it away. We don't need it. They grow very vigorously because the vines don't carry any crop. They are pollen fertile, but they don't produce any fruit. So we're working with the group at Gavallerhof in Germany who has been characterizing the sex locus in grapevine. And what we have now is essentially a bud sport, which has gone from being perfect flowered to stamen flowered. And they're going to be using that as a, a tool in characterizing the sex locus. Uh, previously, they've been able to distinguish between female and not female. And now we have a, an additional genetic tool to help distinguish between perfect and male, or perfect and stamen, which are the two categories of non-female in grapevine. Nearly all of our, our plant material for cultivated wine grapes or table grapes is in fact perfect flowered, but when you work on rootstocks, you can fool around with the other categories of flower sex uh, to your advantage or confusion. Okay, now we talked about nematode resistance, and we've talked about other aspects of rootstocks, and while we're working on rootstocks, because we are not as concerned about fruit quality, until we graft it and then we become interested in fruit quality, we can tinker with the way that grapevines are put together. And hopefully we can tinker with that to our advantage. So some things about grapevines, which if you work on other plants, uh, I think it's important for background. First of all, the tendrils in a grapevine are the lateral meristem that's derived from an inflorescence. So picture a tendril as a bunch of grapes or a cluster of grapes with all the grapes taken off of it. We know that that organ is used for climbing and for support in nature and also in the vineyard. And the function of that organ is interesting to us, but it's kind of peripheral. That's a totally different story for this point. For now, I want you to remember that those are interrelated structures and that either using chemicals or using genetics, we know that those structures can be turned or converted one into the other. Into the other. That's part of the sex change uh, story, which was in the title of my talk. How does this organ or this lateral meristem, which is ostensibly a sexual organ, how does it get assigned to become a vegetative organ? And I know you're asking this question, why would anybody care about that? <laughs> well, we'll talk more about why we care about that. This is a grapevine shoot, and uh, many grapevine varieties have a shoot, comes out in the spring, it looks very much like this. Uh, grapevines do not have separate vegetative and reproductive buds uh, or vegetative and reproductive shoots. There's one shoot and it's both vegetative and reproductive on the same shoot. Typically on a shoot, there's a transition so that the lateral meristems closer to the base of the shoot are reproductive. That is, they are inflorescences or clusters and they develop into bunches. And then there's a unidirectional shift, usually unidirectional, 
as you go out the chute and as you go towards the apical meristem, you're more likely to find uh, tendrils, which are a vegetative lateral meristem. So exactly where that transition point uh, occurs and how that is determined is the topic of some additional research. Something else to notice is that what is usually considered to be a defining characteristic of grapevines, of the genus Vitus, is that every time there's a leaf, there is an axillary bud. We tend to think of this as really key. If you hang around with the five or six Vitaceae botanists in North America, then we can all agree that if it's, a, if it's Vitus, a true grapevine, and there's an axillary position, and there's a leaf, there's going to be a bud in there. In fact, even the cotyledons of a grapevine have axillary buds. Uh, if you grow the grapevine from seed, you can notice those little axillary buds. It, that's not true for all members of the Vitaceae. So other species or other genera have patterns of axillary bud production, and that's part of the phylotactic differences between grapevines and those other species or those other genera. And that becomes important if you're propagating ornamental cystus, for example. You need to leave enough buds, propagating by cuttings, you need to leave enough buds so that you're actually going to have branches, otherwise you'll just get a rooted cutting, which doesn't have any growing points from it. Okay, so more about this later, but now you know how the wild type situation looks like. From a rootstock perspective, I'm very interested in the number of clusters per shoot because the vine is usually going to try to ripen the fruit before it does anything else. That's a reproductive strategy. It's a plant which propagates by seed, and it needs to get those seeds out there into the world in order to propagate. It's not going to propagate itself by cuttings. We are going to propagate it by cuttings, but the vine doesn't know that. This is a selection from our rootstock breeding program. It is highly resistant to root knot nematodes, and it also produces seven, eight, or even up to nine clusters per shoot. That's a lot of fruit. In fact, it's too much fruit. Well, what do you care for a rootstock vine that produces too much fruit? Well, I'll tell you, this vine doesn't produce any wood to speak of. If you grew it in the nursery, it would spend all of its time trying to make fruit and ripening that fruit. And eight or nine clusters per shoot are too many. The vine manages to make it through the winter and it manages to ripen all that fruit, but it doesn't put a lot of energy into making new shoots. And if you're a rootstock breeder or if you run a nursery, you need to have cuttings. That's what you're selling. That's what makes new plants. So this plant doesn't make enough cuttings, but that could mean that we were just a little bit too heavy on the accelerator. I mean. If you know what that transition point is, we've pushed it too far. Now we've got eight or nine nodes which have fertile lateral meristems, reproductive lateral meristems, and maybe we could find that same trigger and ease off on it so that our average number of clusters per shoot is less than one, or maybe it's zero. Can this switch used, be used bidirectionally? It's not true of all switches in plant development, but we think it might be true with these. Uh, mostly, when we're looking at grapevines, the number of clusters per shoot is fewer than five, and in the case of most of our wine grape varieties, it's between one and three. So seeing something which has eight or nine is excessively the other direction. The other day I got an email about someone who was complaining because they had 14 and 15 clusters per shoot, and uh, the material was flowering and they were harvesting it at the same time. So yes, that's a serious problem when you're trying to do mechanized harvest. Another thing to notice about grapevine shoots is that there's a pattern in the distribution of the lateral meristems. Nearly all species have two nodes with a lateral meristem, followed by a node without, like the picture on the top. But one species, Vitus labrusca, usually produces a lateral meristem, and that could be a, an inflorescence, or it could be a tendril, at every node. So most species have a pattern of two with and then a skip, and one species has continuous production at all of the nodes in the mature uh, vine. Mm -hmm. Why is that important to us? Well, that depends. How important are tendrils to you? If you do your own pruning, you probably hate tendrils more than any other part of the grapevine because they are hanging onto the trellis wire and they prevent you from clearing the brush out. I do all my own pruning, so I'm incredibly frustrated uh, with the production of tendrils. And from a rootstock perspective, they don't serve any function. We know that in nature, grapevines need tendrils to climb onto trees and for support, but they probably have very little role in modern viticulture. We've built them a nice trellis, or we're growing our rootstock vines on the ground uh, from a nursery uh, production uh, standpoint, and we would like them to not cling to each other. We'd like them to come cleanly out of the vineyard row uh, when we pull those cuttings. 
We did an experiment where we looked at a series of populations which were crosses of parents with different numbers of tendrils per shoot. So you can picture at one end of the spectrum, you have perfectly two nodes and then a skip. Uh, at the other end, end of the spectrum, it's perfectly every node with a tendril. Uh, in between those are lots of different intermediate phenotypes, like five nodes in a row uh, with a tendril or an inflorescence followed by one skip, which is somewhere intermediate between those two. In this case, we made a cross using the same male parent, which is Vitis labrusca, so all the positions uh, on that vine, either with a cluster or with a tendril, and both of the parents in this case have the same wild-type phenotype, two positions with, followed by one skip. This is to illustrate that there's a difference between the parents, 1613C and 187G, which have the same phenotype, but they breed differently. So when we look at the seedlings and looking at the number of tendrils in the first 12 alternate phylotaxy nodes, we'll talk more about that in a bit, then we see that there are different ratios. Now, if you're interested in increasing the number of tendrils, you should definitely make crosses with 1613 because you've got lots and lots and lots of tendrils in the offspring. Um, Jillian may be a little bit concerned about this because she knows that last summer, when she was a Schallis uh, research scholar, she did a lot of counting of shoots with tendrils, and it turns out that there are some relationships that Jillian doesn't even know about yet because we just did the data analysis last week about how the position of the tendrils and the number of tendrils on the shoot relates to the uh, transition in phylotaxy uh, on an individual seedling. I'm a rootstock breeder, so I want to have the fewest number of tendrils possible. Uh, which direction do we go? Well, in this example, you would definitely pick 187G because it has a much lower average tendril count in its offspring. We might have compelling reasons to go the other direction. For sure, we'd like to know how that's controlled. How does the plant make that pattern? Not just the organ itself, but how is it actually making the pattern? Many of you will recognize a picture of the dwarf grapevine, the pixie vine, which was released by USDA ARS in 2007. It's a cooperative uh, release with the University of California, Davis, and developed using tissue culture from the L1 outside cell layer of Pinot Meunier. So the pixie vine has a naturally occurring gibberellic acid insensitive mutation, and it's a gibberellic acid mutation that reduces the sensitivity of the plant to GA. So as you would expect, it has shorter internodes. Grapevine seeds need gibberellic acid in order to germinate. The dwarf plants from pixie or pixie grapevine crosses require an additional dose of gibberellic acid of five times the ordinary dose of GA in order to induce germination of the dwarf plants. Additionally, in grapevine, the gibberellic acid signal helps determine the assignment of that lateral meristem. So the more GA signal is received in the plant, the less likely that lateral meristem is to become inflorescence. These plants are of lower sensitivity to GA. That means they're less likely to receive that signal. And so the lateral meristems preferentially become inflorescences. Well, that's handy. Now we have a plant which is more or less continuously flowering in the greenhouse, and it's a dwarf vine. And we can use that in genetics experiments or physiology experiments, pathology, et cetera. This is an example of the three classes of seedlings you would expect to see from self-pollinated uh, pixie vine. That's a perfect flowered plant. We have wild type seedlings on the left. You can see the first tendril emerging uh, opposite a leaf. The heterozygote vine in the middle, the heterozygote is blooming. These pictures are taken about 95 days after we plant the seeds. The first flower is actually open on this plant at this point. You can't see it because it's hiding in there in those dwarf internodes. And finally, the homozygous plant on the right. The homozygous plants, uh, quite frankly, are tricky to deal with and uh, we've usually just tossed them out because they're uh, so small and slow growing, but you can actually cultivate those and use those in crossing as well. It's a semi-dominant gene, so if you are making crosses with the pixie vine or other heterozygote dwarfs, you should expect on average to receive back half dwarf vines. Flowering from seed in about 90 to 100 days, we're very close to having a grapevine which will produce two generations per year, and um, since the last time I was giving a talk in this room, which included the pixie vine, we've made some improvements and passed a lot of germplasm. This is Rudy Eibach, who is one of the great breeders and geneticists at Guy Weilerhof in Germany. And you can see that he has his own tiny forest of dwarf grapevines, which were grown from seeds which we sent him from Geneva. Uh, why would they be interested in dwarf grapevines? They would like to develop dwarf grapevine populations which have a sort of wine grape 
characteristics that they like, and also are carrying the disease resistance alleles, which they have been carefully mapping and cloning and developing molecular markers for at the Gavilahar breeding program. So they see the dwarf grape as a way to accelerate their breeding. In addition to accelerating breeding, you might just use it as a way for doing genetic, genetics experiments because the plant becomes sexually mature in such a short period of time and in a small pot, as we can see, then there might be some characteristics that you're not interested enough in to dedicate uh, vineyard space and all that time training and pruning those vines just to get them up in flower. Uh, but you might be interested in doing it on a bench top or perhaps as a year-long uh, student project where they do need care and maintenance, but it can be conducted uh, over the course of one or two semesters rather than the course of an entire graduate student's uh, time at Cornell. We now have white fruited dwarf vines and we have pistolate flowered dwarf vines. The pistolate flowered ones are much easier for making crosses on as you can imagine because they don't need to be emasculated and yet they're still passing on that uh, dwarfing characteristic inherited as a semi-dominant gene. So we haven't released any of that new plant material yet, but for us it's very useful because now we have something which is white fruited, we have materials uh, which are uh, pistolate flowered, and we'll be continuing developing the standard genetic tools, different colors, different flower types, different backgrounds uh, in the dwarf type and making those available for researchers. Okay, quick recap. What's wrong with this picture? Okay, what's this? It's supposed to be a tendril, but lo, it has a shoe tip on it. So why did that happen? Here's another case. This one should have been an inflorescence, but it's got a shoe tip growing out of it. So here again is the main shoot. Here's the inflorescence. Here's where the inflorescence attaches back to the main shoot. And that inflorescence actually has a shoe tip growing out of it. Hmm. This can be an example of virus infection, but this happens so consistently on vines which are, in fact, not infected with virus, that we think there's something else going on and we think that it is involved with genetics. This is a shoot from a population that segregates for that lateral meristem conversion. And you can see the leaves on what should have been a tendril. This one has a full-on shoot tip. And it's producing lots and lots more shoots than it ought to. That's probably the opposite direction. I mean, I'm making viticulture worse than better with this kind of plant material. But what we think is happening is that one of the determinants to shoot development is turned on or it's left on in these plants, even to the extent that the lateral meristems, which should be determinant, are becoming indeterminate vegetative meristems. They're becoming uh, lateral uh, meristems that just keep growing and making new shoots. Interestingly enough, if you look at the shoots on these plants uh, that grow from these indeterminate lateral meristems, they themselves have ordinary tendrils. So it's something associated with the primary shoot axis of that plant as far as we know. It seems to segregate as, a, as an incompletely dominant uh, characteristic, at least in some genetic backgrounds. And this is, again, a characteristic of a trait that we're going to be crossing into our dwarf vines so, so that we can study it through multiple generations but not take up lots of vineyard space. We don't quite know what makes it operate. Uh, another example of strange things from the vineyard. And it looks like an ordinary grape shoot, but when we look up more closely, we see that it is, in fact, missing axillary buds. 100% uh, of the positions across from the inflorescences on this plant are missing axillary buds. And on related plants, we see a lower instance of the missing axillary buds, but always in that same position. So there's something competitive about the inflorescence and the axillary bud production. Uh, we see that also in other species in the Vitaceae, but not reported extensively, and certainly we have no idea of the genetic control within the grapevine itself. Uh, why is that important? Well, now we have the potential to have less branching in the fruiting zone. As a rootstock breeder, I'm going to get rid of all of the axillary buds and just make long straight shoots. We'll strip off the tendrils and the flowers too while we're at it. But even from a wine grape perspective, you might like to see missing axillary buds now and again, we probably have too many buds on the grapevine. We cut off most of them and throw them on the ground anyway. Maybe we could genetically remove some of them in advance. This is not a grapevine. This is Ampelopsis glandulosa. It's another member of the grapevine family. And the genus Ampelopsis is usually distinguished from Vitus. They're fairly closely related genera. Uh, 
uh, one of the characteristics is that Ampelopsis has no true tendril production. All of the lateral meristems are producing inflorescences. If you have a porcelain berry or a pepper vine, these are some common names for Ampelopsis, you can go out to those vines in the fall, in September, or if we have a nice October, they'll still be producing little inflorescences. So they have mature, fully uh, colored up fruit, mature fruit with mature seeds, and all throughout the season they're producing inflorescences. Bad if we wanted to eat them, I wouldn't recommend eating them anyway, but bad if you wanted to eat them and harvest them mechanically because you'd get the whole mix of, of fruit. But interesting from an ecological perspective, say, well, grapevines don't do that. But we have some grapevines that do that. This is the material from the repository, which is continuously producing inflorescences in preference of tendrils. So just like the pixie vine, which produced inflorescences instead of tendrils because it had gibberellic acid mutation, but this is a wild grape from the woods. And it has wild type growth. It has not dwarf stems. It does not require additional gibberellic acid in order to germinate the seeds, but it is producing inflorescences at all of those lateral meristem positions. This one happens to be uh, stamen flowered. The pistillate flowered ones do the same thing. So it's an ampelopsis like grapevine. And we are interested in this material because of the potential for using that in developing a different direction in precocious flowering grapevines, one which is not dwarf but just easily flowering. So we made some crosses with the wild material and uh, then grew seedlings from second generation crosses in our greenhouse in Geneva. And grapevines are usually more fertile on the secondary lateral buds at any given axle than they are in the primary branches of that axle. So we grew the plants up, topped them, took out the primary laterals, and let the secondaries grow. And in fact, we see a segregation for flowering as low as the 10th node. So this seedling started flowering on a branch at the 10th node. And again, that could be accomplished in about 90 to 100 days in our greenhouse. This particular seedling it happens to be staminate flowered. We get the same thing in perfect flowered individuals. What we haven't recovered yet is the perfect flowered, continuous flowering type, just like the wild material. In other words, every position uh, with a perfect flowered inflorescence, just like we see in Ampelopsis. Here are some of the flower clusters, and the perfect flowered ones uh, make little clusters in the greenhouse, uh, just as we've described. Finally, a little bit of discussion about the transition on a grapevine seedling between the different types of phyllotaxy. Here is a grapevine seedling, and it's growing in a little pot in the greenhouse. Grapevine seedling, when it uh, comes out of the seed first, it has a spiral phyllotaxy and does not produce any lateral meristems. And then at some point, and we're not 100% sure what the trigger is, uh, surely there's both a genetic and an environmental component, the grapevine starts making tendrils and it has an alternate phyllotaxy, which is the mature phyllotaxy of that plant. So uh, below between the yellow bars is the juvenile spiral phyllotaxy, and then it makes this unidirectional shift, which can be uh, reproduced by vegetative propagation to making tendrils. We know that tendrils are in fact a sexual structure, even though they're derived to be uh, vegetative and climbing. Here again is a case where uh, we have a population that segregates for the position of the first tendril. So that's the point at which we have shifted from the spiral phyllotaxy to the alternate phyllotaxy. And there's a big difference between these two populations. Um, why would you care about something like this? Uh, I'm sure you're wondering. In fact, it turns out, uh, and this is based on the research that Jillian and I did last summer, the point of transition from spiral phyllotaxy to alternate phyllotaxy is closely related to the number of tendrils that you would expect to see on the plant that is growing once it starts making tendrils. Uh, in other words, the fewer the nodes before it starts to make tendrils, the more tendrils that you're going to have when it finally starts making them. Uh, that indicates that we probably have a way to predict the final number of tendrils on the plant, even though the plants are very, very small. If we're talking about breeding new varieties which are going to be used for experimental purposes, flowering in the greenhouse, like the pictures we just saw derived from those tropical plants, we want them to start making that transition point as early as possible because they don't seem to flower if they have spiral phyllotaxy. They don't start doing that until you get into the alternate phyllotactic mode. 
So we'd like that to happen as low as node 7 or maybe node 5 rather than having to wait till node 9 or above. That every node that we can eliminate from the requirement before we get to alternate file taxi means we're that much closer to getting a rapid continuously firing grapevine. I keep talking about this till uh, Wednesday. I'm going to pause now, catch my breath, and ask Geneva if there are any questions. Geneva has no questions. Geneva, can you hear us? Yes. <laughs> have you ever seen any seedlings that have um, tendrils at node one or two above the crop leaf? Never. Have you? No. <laughs> Uh, I think the lowest I've seen, and Martin, I'd have to go back through my data, is node 4. It certainly varies from population to population. Okay. Guess that's it for now. Okay. I promised you, file a taxi. <laughs> Questions from Ithaca? Yeah. Uh, go back to earlier what you mm -hmm. said. Yes. Um, yet growers always want to use hardwood cuttings. Why not? I mean, you threw out a whole bunch of potentially useful genotypes for nematode resistance. Right. And you could probably get them to root with softwood cuttings. Yes. So, uh, so, 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 why, so why don't we? Yeah. Um, at least part of it has to do with the tradition of the, of the way that grafting has been done. Uh, so let me jump to the far end of that story. For muscadine grapes, they're very difficult to root from Norman cuttings, and historically they were all done by layering. Now well, that's expensive, but with mispropagation, it's 100% switched to propagation by uh, softwood cuttings, and, and it's a standard, and it's no problem. If you are going to make a plant from a, a hardwood cutting and graft it, or a, a dormant, sorry, a green growing bench graft, you can take a dormant cutting and a dormant bud, graft those together, this May, and plant it in the vineyard this June. No waiting. It's ready to go. If you were to take a, a softwood cutting, it, you would ordinarily have to grow it for many months or maybe even a full year before you had a dormant plant that you could graft because even though you can do softwood grafting or green grafting, it's very expensive compared to uh, the bench grafting with dormant buds. So it has much more to do with the structure of the nursery industry and the... Yep. Off. Yep. Get to your you you theoret theoretically you would get there, um, and and I I recognize how there there might be cost savings, but nobody does that at any sort of scale. It seems like got rid of a whole lot of germplasm, which might have been useful. I agree. It might have been useful. Some of it we've kept to use in breeding, but um, I would say that we are on uh, a nursery-driven demand for easily propagated plant material. It costs them the same to take the, to take the cutting and make the graft whether or not they get a plant out of it or not. So they would prefer to have 100% rooting uh, from all their dormant cuttings. All, all woody plants that are propagated very exceptionally are not done by hardwood cuttings. They're done by softwood cuttings. And yeah. All, all the other landscape plants. Right. So, okay. anyway, that's <laughs> right, right, or, right or wrong, that's the system we have. Ian. Going back to the end of your talk, for root knot resistance, are there different mechanisms? Are they pretty similar across the range that you have? What are the mechanisms? Yeah. Uh, so we know for sure that there are at least three different points at which the nematode resistance seems to be implemented or affected. One is that there's a penetration resistance that nematodes don't actually make into the root. Another is that there's nematode penetration to the root and it migrates to the root, but they fail to establish a feeding site. And also we know that in some cases there's establishment of a feeding site, so they've gone in the root, they've, they've moved around, they've established, but they don't reproduce. So since resistance is defined as the impact on the reproduction, any three of those would uh, likely to be uh, included in the reproduction. And we see all sorts of those segregating in our populations. So Chiefly- those are the different forms that you're trying to pyramid is some combination of those three mechanisms? No. Well, we're not looking at a mechanistic approach. What we're looking at is different individual genes uh, to provide protection. And so we're looking at the resistance, meaning we just look at the reproduction of the adult female nematode. And when we're trying to pyramid sources, we look at ones which 
prohibit reproduction. In a sense, we're summarizing all the different types of resistance uh, which could be implemented. So we don't actually have a mechanistic approach to that. And is there any relationship with the Bruton nematode resistance mechanisms and Zipnema, or is there any sort of really broad spectrum nematode feeding deterrent good, mechanisms? Good question. Uh, Ziphonema mandex is a dagger nematode. There are other dagger nematode species which feed on grape roots. We don't think that there's any mechanistic relationship between those because there are some materials which are highly resistant to Ziphonema mandex nematodes, such as O3916 rootstock, but they're highly susceptible to root knot and others which are very root knot nematode resistant and have susceptibility to Ziphonema mandex. So as far as we know, there's no uh, correlation or uh, pleiotropy with regard to those nematode resistances. And we're not working with other nematode species, but work from other groups, Andy Walker's at UC Davis, seems to indicate that those are independently controlled. You can find resistance to other nematodes, but it doesn't necessarily relate to root non-nematode resistance. Do you find, you were mentioning earlier that uh, <coughs> you could influence the amount of top growth that you get on the on the vine by the rootstock. Correct. Select. Uh, do you find also an influence uh, more directly on quality of the of the wine that is produced from that from that grape? A direct influence? No. But indirectly through the king growth and stuff. Like that. Correct. So <coughs> definitely rootstocks influence the growth and development of the canopy, and that uh, influence on the growth and development of the canopy influences all sorts of things water relation to the plant, light environment in the canopy, and those in turn influence fruit composition and wine quality. But as if you had two identical canopies with different rootstocks, it would be very unusual to expect a difference in the fruit composition other than that what comes from the canopy architecture. Good. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.